So um, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here today with uh, with the other speakers and, and also to have the chance to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing um, within the center uh, over the last um, number of years. Um, so mm -hmm. I want to begin by um, see, starting by um, thanking my research group at Caltech. This is a recent picture uh, of the group. Um, and. Um, you know, it's really a pleasure to work with these people, and, and everything I'm going to tell you about today um, is uh, reliant on on their efforts and their creativity, uh, as well as their certainly um, you know hard work. I think you know one of the things about the center, you see a couple of young uh, folks down here, um, and that has been uh, extremely enjoyable is is the outreach component uh, of the the group, and so. Um, I just wanted to point out that currently in the lab, as part of this outreach, um, we actually have seven high school students uh, performing synthetic chemistry research in the group, and so that's a that's a direct uh, function of our involvement in the in the center. And so, um, you know, that that's a, a component to the center that is often um, underplayed, but I think it's a real significant one. Okay, so within the group, um, <clears throat> our uh, effort focuses on um, really broad areas of synthesis and reaction discovery that, that go far beyond um, CH functionalization. And so often to become inspired um, in terms of thinking about projects in the lab, we start our research efforts on the left-hand side of the slide thinking about complicated target molecules. Most of the time these are natural product molecules um, that embody a lot of the sort of beauty of structural components that I find um, fascinating in organic chemistry. So these are compounds that have you know, polycyclic structures, lots of rings, lots of heterocycles, um, lots of stereochemistry, unusual functionality, and kind of all embedded into one structure, which makes unveiling that, um, that array of functionality um, and chemistry really challenging at a late stage in the synthesis. Um, coupled to that uh, desire to generate these types of structurally complex molecules is an equal desire in um, trying to, you know, inspire new methods that might enable that. So the idea is that we use the complex molecule really to drive our thought processes in terms of what we don't know how to do in synthesis. And then we try to move into the central part of the slide and develop methods that would allow us to, um, you know, overcome certain synthetic hurdles um, that we had in mind in terms of strategy. Uh, of course, this is a uh, strat is, you know, an approach that basically then lends itself to taking these methods that you develop and, and applying them to new targets. And if the new targets are, um, you know, selected from the same types of molecules or same subset of molecules as on the left-hand slide, um, this then becomes a feedback loop where the targets are really driving methods development in both directions you know, in terms of um, <clears throat> inspiration as well as then overcoming these hurdles. Um, in a lab like mine, though, really the, the, the reality of it is not this kind of fabricated feedback loop, but rather a rel relatively chaotic scenario where, um, you know, many different projects are ongoing at the same time, and there are lots of different um, ideas, you know, floating around the lab about different parts of different projects, and it's really those people on the first slide that are the key to making these unusual connections um, and hopefully leading to a scenario where you know, one plus one equals four, or one plus one equals eight, instead of just two. Um, and so the outcome of these kinds of um, endeavors is usually far more than the sum of the parts. Um, we have overarching goals for the group in terms of synthesis, you know, we're trying to develop and discover new strategies and tactics that allow us to access molecules that hopefully people will care about. On the method side of things, we're trying to uh, invent enabling chemistry that will allow us to solve the problems that we're trying to solve, but you know, I often tell my group that it's it's more important um, for, you know, it, say, it's nice to put a, a compound into a bottle, like a natural product, but I think what's more important is to enable other people to put lots of compounds into lots of bottles. And for a lab like mine, and I think, frankly, a center like ours, it's developing these methods that will then move out into the pharmaceutical industry and other related chemical industries, and we'll actually see, um, you know, broad application, as we've just seen in a talk from Shane, um, that's really the goal, I think, of, of a lab like ours. And of course, you know, the nice thing about being in an academic lab is that you get to sort of follow your nose um, and hopefully uncover and exploit fundamentally new things. So I won't mention these again, but these are the kind of overarching goals that the group um, has um, in mind at the outset of most of our projects. So one of the things that we've been involved in, and certainly we're involved in prior to joining the center, was the development of a series of enantioselective allylic alkylation reactions 
um, that were modeled initially on um, some early uh, chemistry from Jiro Tsuji back in the early 1980s and certainly um, built on seminal studies by Trost and Helmshin, Beckfell, Hayashi, Hartwig, and many others who've been involved in this area of asymmetric allele calculation. But in our hands, the, the prototypical reaction type is shown below, where when we utilize um, typically an asymmetric phosphenoxazoline ligand um, of the variety um, first um, you know, spearheaded by Faults and Helmsch and, and Williams and, and others. We use that in conjunction with the palladium zero catalyst. This undergoes a decarboxylative uh, process that we believe forms this oxygen bound palladium enolate and a sigma bound carbon uh, allyl unit that undergo a kind of reductive elimination process that produces these alpha quaternary carbonyl products. Um, and these compounds are really quite versatile because they contain a ring typically uh, a carbonyl group, an, an alpha substituent group that can be a variety of different groups, as you'll see in a second, uh, as well as this terminal olefin um, unit. And with olefins and carbonyls present in all of the products that we generate, as well as these high enantio pure um, uh, building blocks, you know, the, there are a lot of chemistries that can be applied to these kinds of systems. Um, and so in the fundamental um, up building of this, um, of this method, um, we applied this to a variety of different carbocyclic systems, a whole host of heterocyclic systems, and of course with these kinds of general methods in hand, we could apply these to many different natural product syntheses, uh, as you can see below. Um, but we were interested, as I mentioned, in, in what we might be able to do with some of the products of these kinds of reactions and how we might be able to convert these into um, additional sort of round two building blocks, let's say, or second generation building blocks. And that's really where some of our early efforts in the center um, uh, were. Um, so for instance, some of these allylic alkylation products, these are unusual compounds, although they contain terminal olefins, and one would imagine you know, relatively accessible um, allylic CH bonds for functionalization. The fact that these are situated next to a very hindered um, tetra substitute, in many cases, quaternary center at the alpha carbon to the carbonyl, that blocks a lot of chemistry. And so many of the known types of methods for allylic oxidation or allylic functionalization fail on these systems because they're just simply different and more sterically encumbered um, than, than most of the ones that have been you know, demonstrated in sort of broadly applicable methods. Um, so we had to go in and actually um, you know, alter reaction conditions and invent sort of new sets of conditions that would allow the functionalization of these particular types of building blocks. So um, in a paper that was um, uh, uh, performed by uh, Zhang Yojing and Nick O'Connor, a postdoc and a grad student in the group, um, they modified a palladium 02 cycle using um, a variety of palladium 2 precursors, these hexafluoroacac ligands or palladium acetates, using oxone as the oxidant, and whether or not there was water present in the system uh, or not led to, in the case that has no water, the allylic acetoxylation product with migration of the olefin into the um, more thermodynamically situated uh, olefin, the internal olefin, uh, or alternatively um, with concomitant subsequent oxidation in the presence of water to these enals, and then these allylic acetates enals could be utilized in, in further functionalization chemistry. Another type of chemistry that was um, you know, prevalent for us on these olefinic side chains was thinking about Wacker oxidation, which was already mentioned today by, by Jin. Um, the Wacker oxidation is a kind of formal CH functionalization event that typically goes with Markovnikov uh, selectivity. We were interested in cases of anti-Markovnikov uh, selective processes, and, and actually my colleague Bob Grubbs around the same time had um, uh, just uh, published a variety of, of methods, but one in particular that utilized this nitrite modified sort of suji bakker oxidation that would uh, presumably involve this radical type addition of a nitrite system onto an olefin and eventually lead to the anti-Markovnikov aldehyde products. Um, this was work done by Zach Wickens predominantly um, in the Grubbs lab. And so we were interested in to whether or not um, these types of Wacker uh, systems, particularly these anti-Markovnikov Wackers, would be applicable to the very hindered systems that we developed for the synthesis of these um, uh, quaternary containing building blocks. Um, and so Kelly Kim in the group and Jiaming Li, a co-student with Bob Grubbs and, and I, um, investigated this and showed that a variety of, of hindered systems um, indeed undergo these anti-Markovnikov uh, 
uh, oxidation reactions to produce the aldehydes um, from the terminal olefin. And this was actually used in a synthesis of a Cyantha Wigan framework that was performed by Kelly Kim, wherein we performed a double asymmetric alkylation reaction built on chemistry by John Enquist from some years uh, prior to that. Um, a ring closing metathesis forms the seven membered ring, but then um, to set up an aldehyde, um, an intramolecular acyl radical cyclization that forms the final bond here, we needed this aldehyde and actually the, um, the anti markovnikov bakker oxidation uh, performed nobly um, in this system um, with multiple olefins and a carbonyl present as well as these very hindered um, allylic systems. And so um, that aldehyde then could uh, undergo this cyclization and lead to the synthesis of this framework. The framework was actually important in the context of the CH Functionalization Center because Kelly Kim was a, a member of the center and actually wanted to use the Cyantha Wigan framework as a launch point for, again, investigating a variety of different types of CH functionalization in a kind of real world context, thinking about a structure that has, you know, rings that are sort of unusual, five, six, and seven membered rings, olefins present or not, and carbonyls present or not in the presence of, you know, hindrance and, and, um, and ring conformations. So Kelly embarked on really a, a broad study of this chemistry, um, and in particular on this Cyantha Wigan framework found that the seven membered ring was particularly susceptible to a variety of, um, CH functionalization reactions, whereas the carbonyl components here tended to deactivate the A and the B ring as well as to some degree the quaternary centers also deactivated those systems. And so allylic functionalization tended to work reasonably well out here on the, the remote methyl group of the allo unit. Alternatively, if that olefin were not present, we could um, investigate a variety of tertiary and secondary selective CH functionalizations that either would functionalize to install um, a variety of groups Y, uh, or in this particular case of chloro-selective functionalization, this diastereoselective chlorination of this secondary position, which was quite interesting, um, and based on some chemistry by uh, Eric Alexanian. So this was all kind of setting up our, our notion that CH functionalization should be utilized um, as a strategic bond disconnection in synthesis. And so to investigate that further, um, a graduate student, Stephen Lascott, joined the lab and started investigating the synthesis of this molecule on the right nigelidine A. Um, and so in order to um, think about the synthesis of nigelidine A, um, we actually decided to perform a very late stage um, oxidation event to, in essence, retrosynthetically excise this oxo group and go back to a, a lower oxidation state of nigelidine A, the desoxy uh, for, uh, derivative. We did that actually from a strategic sense in that, that nigelidine A, you could imagine through ring uh, methyl migration and perhaps deprotonation, you could eventually get at something aromatic. And so the stability of nigelidine A and intermediates leading up to that were somewhat questionable to us. So we decided to remove that oxygen atom, go back to a tricyclic structure like this, which could be very easily disconnected back to a single building block, again with the quaternary center of the terminal olefin, and that terminal olefin could be converted then into this um, B and the C rings. And in fact, that was quite st straightforward. So the building block was prepared in seven steps from cyclohexane dione, five more steps then takes us on this tricyclic intermediate and leaves us with this, you know, this final problem of CH oxidation um, to access this carbonyl compound. Um, of course, this is not as easy as it maybe seems in that there's a single red component, that's the bond that we'd like, or the, the position we'd like to um, oxidized, but there are a number of other activated or allylic positions um, that are highlighted in gray that we would have to contend with. And it turned out that um, our best efforts um, in this um, were in essence led to non-selective oxidation. Um, and that was using, you know, sort of any and all stoichiometric reagents as well as catalytic reagents that we could um, access. And that was, of course, you know, bringing to bear you know, all of the chemistry that we know about via the CH functionalization center. So this was um, challenging uh, to say the least. And I think this is a great example of, of why our center is important in that, you know, it gets us thinking about challenging situations like this that are actually real world situations. You know, we needed to oxidize this in essence to finish the synthesis of Nigella DNA. And so we were um, certainly motivated to do so. Fortunate for, um, for us and for Stephen, we have a colleague um, in Francis Arnold, of course, who everybody knows now um, and hopefully knew beforehand. Um, and, you know, Francis um, 
has been investigating engineered enzymes, in particular cytochrome P450s, for a variety of oxidations. And it turned out that her lab actually had a whole freezer full of, um, we could say, promiscuous variants, non-natural promiscuous engineered variants of cytochrome P450s. And it turned out that actually one of those enzymes that was in that fridge that we could screen through um, performed the selective oxidation at the red position. We could follow that up with the alcohol to carbonyl oxidation to access nigelidine A. And so I think this highlights a really interesting opportunity for synthetic chemists that there's a lot of great engineering um, that's going on with enzymes. And synthetic chemists, I think, largely have not tapped into this um, potential as you know, thinking about these as reagents for synthesis. And so uh, we hope that this will you know, inspire others and, and we certainly are extremely interested in pursuing this uh, in our own labs. The uh, project I'd like to finish with today actually goes back more to strategy. Um, and it's uh, centered around a, a molecule called juramycin. And juramycin is a, a beautiful structure. It's a pentacyclic um, bis tetrahydroisoquinoline anti-tumor antibiotic. It's a member of a much larger family of structures, which are highlighted on, on this slide, at least again, some of the members. And really the, the sort of foremost member of this class is this molecule, actinocidin 743. This is a compound that is now clinically approved for the treatment of certain solid tumors um, in the US and in Europe. Um, these molecules have been around for a long time. Um, Juromycin itself had been synthesized, um, or has been synthesized on a number of previous occasions. Um, and what is the case with this class of compounds is that based on the structures that you might imagine, that the synthesis of the tetrahydroisoquinoline um, in essentially all of these cases is dominated by the electrophilic aromatic substitution or in particular the pictet spengler um, reaction. And so we wanted to try to devise a synthesis that would um, not be reliant on pictet spengler chemistry. And so our retrosynthetic analysis is shown on this slide. Um, you can imagine disconnecting this molecule along this carbonyl amine, uh, eventually going back to an ester for lactamization. Uh, and in a very sort of sweeping retrosynthetic move, we decided to take this bis tetrahydroisoquinoline and simply excise um, uh, four molecules of hydrogen um, in a sort of process that would take us back from the tetrahydro compound to a simple bis isoquinoline. This was motivated in part by some arine chemistry that our lab was interested in. We believed we could disconnect both of these um, isoquinolins by a double arine annulation process, which would leave us uh, back to this arine precursor um, and this precursor to this dehydroamino uh, ester compound. But what was important is that this retrosynthesis, because it would utilize arine chemistry and selectivities inherent to that, would not be reliant on pictet spengler chemistry. We thought this would be a, an orthogonal synthesis to the syntheses that were present uh, in the literature. I want to highlight, though, for a second that the notions around this, um, what we're calling here a stereoselective reduction, um, and you know, how we envision that in the forward sense. So this, is, again, is not CH functionalization, but it's critical to the thought process of this synthesis. So you could imagine, for instance, this bisisoquinoline perhaps chelating a metal and then starting a reduction cascade where um, likely the CN double bond in either the B ring or the D ring would be the most susceptible to reduction. If one reduces that um, in either direction, um, you could then imagine the next most susceptible bond to reduction would be the remaining olefin in that heterocyclic ring, the partially reduced ring. We believe that um, because of ke chelation um, and already setting that initial stereocenter, you can imagine that the second or subsequent reduction would occur uh, in a syn facial manner, um, so that you would uh, produce a syn 1 3 disubstituted uh, isoquinoline. If the chelate remained intact, one would envision that the next most susceptible reduction would be again the CN double bond of the other heterocyclic ring, but that we would already have a reinforcing of the stereochemistry by a kind of um, you know, chelation effect that would sort of start to adopt a sort of um, convex concave type system. And so this self-reinforcing diastereoselectivity ultimately would lead, we believe, to a product like the one at the bottom, wherein all uh, four molecules of H2 would add from the same face uh, of this chelating uh, this heterocycle. That was the notion. Um, and if you impart then an asymmetric reduction for that first CN bond forming a reaction, you would have perhaps not only a diastereoselective process, but also an enantioselective process. 
So that took us back then to our retrosynthesis. That was the, the notion of that reduction reaction. Um, but I want to take just one second and say, you know, these silyl triflates actually were a reason to launch off in a very different mode of CH functionalization. And this is what I talked about the last time that I was involved in one of these virtual uh, symposia, which was this um, interesting potassium terbutoxide initiated CH silylation chemistry that we developed um, in collaboration again with my colleague Bob Grubbs. Um, subsequent to that um, investigation, uh, we actually launched a massive uh, uh, mechanistic investigation that was spearheaded by my student, David Schumann. Um, and so just to, to note to all of the graduate students out there, if, if you've ever thought it was hard to wrangle in your own advisor, imagine David having to wrangle all of us and his coworkers, as well as all of these other PIs uh, for these two mechanistic papers. Anyway, he did a fantastic job, um, and um, you can read about that, the the developments there um, and listen to the story, um, which is I think is on YouTube for the first time. But to go back to our synthesis, um, we were using these silyl triflates um, as precursors to arines. We could generate this bis dehydroamino ester, but unfortunately, this double arine uh, annulation process um, was not a feasible synthetic route to access the bis isoquinolate. But we were intrigued enough about this um, tetrahydrogenation reaction that we decided to go back and um, reevaluate our retrosynthesis. Um, and here is really where um, CH functionalization came into the, to the play uh, for, this, for this synthesis. So again, we'll go back to this lactam, disconnect that to the bis tetrahydro compound, excise hydrogen. Um, and now the notion was, this is just a simple bis heterocyclic system. Maybe we could access this by a, a cross-coupling event um, among those two um, uh, heterocycles. That would take us back to, um, in theory, this um, heterocyclic triflate, uh, as well as this organometallic. And of course, um, you know, organometallic such as this at the, the one position of an isoquinolin, which is akin to the two position, say, of a pyridine, are relatively unstable and challenging organometallics to utilize in cross-coupling events. And so we um, took a step back and decided to, at this stage, employ a CH functionalization cross-coupling uh, in order to enable this um, synthesis as, as, in terms of building, um, stitching these two heterocyclic units together. And for that, we would rely on some beautiful chemistry that was developed by the late Keith Fanio um, in conjunction with graduate students, um, including Elsie uh, Campo, who's been a real um, uh, so strong supporter of this, of this center um, through his position at Merck. So this was the key step. Um, and as you can see, um, that performed tremendously well, employing a, a modified, slightly modified version of the FANIO chemistry on this now very complex um, isoquinolin anoxide and this isoquinolin triflate um, via this um, uh, concerted methylation deprotonation event, we believe. Um, this cross-coupling occurs on a you know, multigram scale and, and outstanding yield. That, with a little bit of additional um, work, we were able to um, hydroxylate and acetylate the benzylic position here of this uh, left-hand isoquinolin in the presence of other oxidizable positions, um, remove the remaining anoxide, um, and then oxidize that um, hydroxyl up to the um, carbomethoxy group. And that sets up this key um, hydrogenation reaction, which I'm just showing the final result here. We could take this bisheterocyclic system, uh, employ this uh, iridium um, custom-built xylophos um, ligand, so this bisphosphine, uh, in the presence of high-pressure hydrogen, first at 60 degrees for a while, and then at 80 degrees. And out of that single reaction, we isolate an 83% yield of this material, which um, you know is greater than 20 to 1 diastereic selectivity and 88% EE, which could be recrystallized to greater than 99% uh, EE on half a gram scale. And the absolute and relative stereochemistries of that hydrogenation atta uh, were determined by um, single crystal X-ray analysis of a, a close-in derivative. With that compound in hand, there were a number of challenges that remained, but really the, the most key fun functional challenge was installation of uh, oxidation at these two internal CH bonds that remain on the two aromatic rings. Um, to accomplish that, we actually needed to um, perform a two-step method. First, chlorination with n chlorosaccharin uh, and then hydroxylation using, um, in this very complex system, I think using a Buckwall dimer um, and this uh, ad bipifaz um, ligand, um, that installs the two hydroxyls, and then uh, we could reduce the lactam, uh, oxidize to the quinones, that 
uh, access geranomycin A, uh, and then um, removal of the cyano, conversion of that to the hydroxy, and installation of an acetate uh, completes the synthesis of geromycin. So the key here, though, was really enabling, um, enabled by the CH fragment coupling reaction. So utilizing CH functionalization as the key um, building block synthesis in terms of bringing components together uh, to build up this bisisoquinolin system, uh, and then, of course, this um, asymmetric hydrogenation reaction that desymmetrizes this flat uh, compound and installs um, all of the stereocenters essentially present uh, in the natural product. Um, and I, I really want to highlight the postdoc, Eric Wellin, um, who uh, came to my group from uh, Dave McMillan's lab and really pioneered the, the final stages of this synthesis and, and, um, and troubleshot uh, everything um, that I've talked about today uh, on that synthesis. Really an outstanding postdoc. So with that, I'll just thank um, the current and former members of my group who've been involved in the CH Functionalization Center, uh, our collaborators um, within the center, and our collaborators, importantly, outside of the center, uh, as well as um, the CH Center itself and these other agencies um, for funding. And with that, um, thanks.